Hi everyone, praise the Lord. Again, we are back looking at the book of Philippians chapter 1. Now we are in verse 19. Okay, and it says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. For I know that this will turn out, and Paul is talking about his prison condition, his prison place, that it will turn out. And he also talks about the preachers who are preaching both out of envy and strife and out of goodwill. Okay, so meaning that there was a possibility that Paul had been scandalized because he was in prison. And some preachers used that to scandalize him. Okay, and so he's saying, for I know that this thing will turn out, whatever it is will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, Every situation that you go through, you've got to take this word and say, for I know it will turn out for my deliverance, whatever circumstance. And you see, in life, we go through very difficult times. For example, now in Kenya, we are going through very difficult times and, and you know, economic times. And I pray today that it will turn out for your deliverance. But for deliverance to come, whatever it is that you need to be delivered out of, maybe you need to be delivered out of uh, uh, financial problems, you need to be delivered out of addictions, you need to be delivered out of uh, indecisions, anything that you need to be delivered out of, you've got to know that this will happen through prayer, okay? And there's no other way but through prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, this word supply means that Jesus Christ himself multiplies himself in us. The Spirit of Jesus Christ comes upon us, but he will not just come upon us. There is a process. So number one, it will be, you'll be delivered through your prayer. For Paul says, whatever I'm going through, I will be delivered. Uh, it will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer. So he's counting on the prayers of the saints. He's counting on the prayer of the Philippian church that you've got to pray for me so that my deliverance will come. But he was also saying, I am confident that I will be delivered because I know that you guys have been praying. And so he says, through prayer, and that is number one, and number two, through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, how is this supply of Jesus Christ received by believers? Okay, so verse 20 answers, and he says, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. In nothing. You've got to have an expectation that you will be delivered. You've got to have that expectation, honest expectation. Honest expectation is just, it's just not a normal expectation. It is an intention, in, you know, planned expectation intended expectation, earnestly expecting. I am expecting earnestly that God will bless me. You begin to say, I am in earnest expectation that I will be delivered. I am at the verge of my deliverance, at the verge of my freedom. Okay? And so he says, for I know that this situation that I'm going through will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer, number one, through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, and this will happen. I will be delivered through your prayer, through the supply of Jesus Christ, and this will happen according to my honest expectation and hope. Okay? Two things, that honest expectation and hope, that in nothing shall I be ashamed. In nothing, no matter what I do, I shall I shall not be ashamed, okay? Honest expectation and hope. In these two words, Paul rested. In these two convictions, Paul rested. In expectation and in hope. I am expectant and I have hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. He will not be ashamed in anything. But then he continued to say, though I put my, you know, my, my I have an expectation and I have hope, 
but with all boldness, as always, so now also will uh, also Christ will be magnified in my body. Hi, let me let me do a reverse because I think it's important to understand this point. First of all, he says, "I will be delivered through your prayers." and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I will be delivered through this by my honest, uh, according to my honest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. In nothing I shall be ashamed. But, he says, with all boldness as always. Okay? With all boldness. Kama kawaida, how bold I have been, how bold we have been, so now also Christ will be glorified. Even now in my prison state. Even now in my chain state, Christ will still be magnified in my body. In my body. Then he says, whether by life or death. And, and that stands out for me. And I said, oh my God. In other words, I am open. Whether I die or I live, Christ will be magnified. Now when you begin to look at this scripture, you begin to see the positive mindset of Paul. He's there. As we said, he was bound to Jesus Christ. His chains were for Jesus Christ. His life was for Jesus Christ. And even his death. And so he says, Christ will be magnified. I will be delivered. But this deliverance doesn't have to come with my freedom. It can come with my freedom. It can come with my death. But either way, I will be delivered. For to me, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live, it is because of Jesus Christ. If I die, I have gained. Now, have you ever heard anyone who says those kind of words? That for them to live, oh, I live because of Jesus. If I die, oh, I am so happy, I have gained. Okay? It's always the other side, uh, the other opposite. People want to live because according to, to them, living is gaining. If I die, it's Christ. If I die, I go to heaven. Okay? And, and it's just the way the world is now. But Paul says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And then he continues to expound on that portion. Now remember, he's writing to the Philippians. He's in prison, and he's trying to explain. Now the letter has got meat now. Okay? And he says, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet, what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to be part and be with Christ, which is far better. Okay. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing uh, for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. So now he begins to, he explains this concept, he explains the, this new philosophy that he's introducing to the minds of believers. And he says, if I die, I gain. If I live, it is because of Jesus Christ. Yet, I do not know what to ask for. In other words, it is as if he had struggled to pray for this thing. He did not know whether to ask God to keep him alive or to kill him. And he says, I am hard-pressed between the two. I am hard-pressed between living and dying. <laughs> I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, and that is far better for me. But I also want to live for your sakes. So Paul did not desire to live just because he wanted to live. He desired to live for the sake of the believers of Jesus Christ. If he was asked, he would have chosen death. But in this case, he says, I shall remain. I am confident of this, that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. I will remain with you so that you progress. I don't know how many people in church today or how many of us as believers would find ourselves in this kind of situation where we are so close to Jesus that we want to die and just go to him. 
that we are torn between living and dying. That's how much Paul and Jesus were connected. Many of us today, at the sight of death, we call on the name of Jesus and we refuse death. And that is still okay. But have we ever gotten so close to Jesus that we want to go home? And we say, you know what? Thank you, world. It's been real. I want to go to my Jesus. Or are we saying, Jesus, oh, keep me alive for a longer, for a longer time because I will be with you forever anyway. Let me enjoy this side of earth. If God was to come to you and ask you one question, why should I keep you alive another hour? What would your answer be? If he was to come to you and say, all right, I've decided to take you home, but give me one reason for why I should keep you here on earth. What is your reason for living? What is your reason for dying? If you ask those questions in your life, you'll begin to understand the meaning of your life. If you have not, some, if you have not found something that you can die for, you have not found something to live for. You've got to find something that you can say, you know what? I can die for this. If you find that thing, then you have the right to live. Thank you. God bless you. And I pray that you'll find that one thing you can die for. Amen.